the United Nations, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These are three of the largest institutions in the world, yet all three are impaired by the separation that occurs between the decisions they make and the people in whose name those decisions are made. Rather than championing equality, they can act as a process by which the world's richest countries can dictate to its poorest. The United Nations is a coalition of 192 states, yet the decision-making of this body is purely reliant on just five. These are the five permanent members of the Security Council, the USA, Great Britain, France, Russia and China. Under Article 108 of the UN Charter, these countries all have a veto on any UN resolution. So for any action to take place, these five countries must all agree. This effectively means that the votes of all the other countries are irrelevant. Similarly, both the World Bank and the IMF require an 85% majority to pass any substantial resolution. But the share of votes within each of these institutions is not equal. The USA controls 17% of the shares in the IMF and 15% of the shares in the World Bank. Thus, no decision can be made in the IMF or World Bank unless the United States agrees to it. In this way, the USA can scupper any decision that the majority of the countries wish to perform, and the rich can dictate to the poorest the way in which they should be governed. Small, poorer countries have little or no standing in these institutions, for the bigger a political unit is, the less democratic it is, because there is less chance that your voice will be heard. The UN, IMF and World Bank are giant global institutions. Were this taking place on a national level, we would immediately recognise this as an oligarchy or an autocracy. But because we are not confronted with the system's complete lack of democracy, we do nothing. The people of poorer countries, however, are confronted with this every single day, as they are the ones who suffer the effects of unfair trade, national debt and Western economic intervention. And so they are far more aware of the monstrosities done in our name, yet they can do absolutely nothing about it because the actions of their governments are barred. The responsibility then is on us, as citizens of the nations which have a larger say within these institutions, to end such an unfair distribution of power. However, we are also unable to act because our own governments never engage with its citizens about these issues. There is a complete disjunction between ourselves and what we might wish for and what is done in our name at the international level. In a world of photocopy democracy, we elect a government for a handful of parochial issues, crime, tax, domestic economy, seldom an international issue unless we are engaged in a war that threatens our national integrity. The elected government then appoints figures onto the worldwide platforms of the UN, World Bank and IMF. But this action was not what we voted for and at no point has legitimacy been conferred upon it. There is no connection at all in the way an institution like the UN makes decisions through our national representatives and the demands and will of the people they supposedly represent. And the best illustration to prove this? What is the name of the British ambassador to the United Nations?